Cicero Marcus Tullius Cicero, was a Roman philosopher, politician, lawyer, orator, political theorist, consul and constitutionalist. He came from a wealthy municipal family of the Roman equestrian order, and is widely considered one of Rome's greatest orators and prose stylists. His influence on the Latin language was so immense that the subsequent history of prose in not only Latin but European languages up to the 19th century was said to be either a reaction against or a return to his style. According to Michael Grant, the influence of Cicero upon the history of European literature and ideas greatly exceeds that of any other prose writer in any language. Cicero introduced the Romans to the chief schools of Greek philosophy and created a Latin philosophical vocabulary, with neologisms such as humanitas, qualitas, quantitas, and essentia, distinguishing himself as a linguist, translator, and philosopher. Petrarch's rediscovery of Cicero's letters is often credited for initiating the 14th century Renaissance in public affairs, humanism, and classical Roman culture. According to Polish historian Tadeusz Zielinski, Renaissance was above all things a revival of Cicero, and only after him and through him of the rest of classical antiquity. The peak of Cicero's authority and prestige came during the 18th century Enlightenment and his impact on leading Enlightenment thinkers such as John Locke, David Hume, and Montesquieu was substantial. His works rank among the most influential in European culture, and today still constitute one of the most important bodies of primary material for the writing and revision of Roman history, especially the last days of the Roman Republic. Though he was an accomplished orator and successful lawyer, Cicero believed his political career was his most important achievement. It was during his consulship that the Second Catilinarian Conspiracy attempted the government overthrow through an attack on the city from outside forces, and Cicero suppressed the revolt by executing five conspirators without due process. During the chaotic latter half of the first century BC marked by civil wars and the dictatorship of Gaius Julius Caesar, Cicero championed a return to the traditional republican government. Following Julius Caesar's death Cicero became an enemy of Mark Antony in the ensuing power struggle, attacking him in a series of speeches. He was prescribed as an enemy of the state by the Second Triumvirate and consequently killed in 43 BC. Personal life Early life Cicero was born in 106 BC in Arpinum, a hill town 100 kilometers, 62 miles southeast of Rome. His father was a well-to-do member of the equestrian order and possessed good connections in Rome. However, being a semi-invalid, he could not enter public life and studied extensively to compensate. Although little is known about Cicero's mother, Helvia, it was common for the wives of important Roman citizens to be responsible for the management of the household. Cicero's brother Quintus wrote in a letter that she was a thrifty housewife. Cicero's cognomen, or personal surname, comes from the Latin for chickpea, Caesar. Plutarch explains that the name was originally given to one of Cicero's ancestors who had a cleft in the tip of his nose resembling a chickpea. However, it is more likely that Cicero's ancestors prospered through the cultivation and sale of chickpeas. Romans often chose down-to-earth personal surnames, the famous family names of Fabros, Lentulus, and pi so come from the Latin names of beans, lentils, and peas. Plutarch writes that Cicero was urged to change this deprecatory name when he entered politics, but refused, saying that he would make Cicero more glorious than Scorus, swollen ankled and cadulous, puppy. During this period in Roman history, to be considered cultured meant being able to speak both Latin and Greek. Cicero, like most of his contemporaries, was therefore educated in the teachings of the ancient Greek philosophers, poets and historians. The most prominent teachers of oratory at that time were themselves Greek. Cicero used his knowledge of Greek to translate many of the theoretical concepts of Greek philosophy into Latin, thus translating Greek philosophical works for a larger audience. It was precisely his broad education that tied him to the traditional Roman elite. According to Plutarch, Cicero was an extremely talented student, whose learning attracted attention from all over Rome, affording him the opportunity to study Roman law under Quintus Messius Scaevola. 
Cicero's fellow students were Gaius Marius Minor, Servius Sulpicius Rufus, who became a famous lawyer, one of the few whom Cicero considered superior to himself in legal matters, and Titus Pomponius. The latter two became Cicero's friends for life, and Pomponius, who later received the nickname Atticus would become Cicero's longtime chief emotional support and advisor. Cicero wanted to pursue a public career in politics along the steps of the Curses Honorum. In 90 BC 88 BC, he served both Gnaeus Pompeius Strabo and Lucius Cornelius Sulla as they campaigned in the Social War, though he had no taste for military life, being an intellectual first and foremost. Cicero started his career as a lawyer around 83-81 BC. His first major case, of which a written record is still extant, was his 80 BC defense of Sextus Rossius on the charge of patricide. Taking this case was a courageous move for Cicero. Patricide was considered an appalling crime, and the people whom Cicero accused of the murder, the most notorious being Chrysogonus, were favorites of Sulla. At this time it would have been easy for Sulla to have the unknown Cicero murdered. Cicero's defense was an indirect challenge to the dictator Sulla, and on the strength of his case, Rossius was acquitted. Cicero's case was divided into three parts. The first was explaining exactly the charge brought by Aricius. He explained how a rustic son of a farmer, who lives off of the pleasures of his own land, would not have gained anything from committing patricide because he would have inherited his father's land anyway. The second was the boldness and greed of two of the accusers, Magnus and Capito. Cicero tells the jury that they are the more likely perpetrators for murder because they are both greedy for conspiring together against a fellow kinsman, and Magnus boldness for being unashamed to appear in court to support the false charges. The third explained that Chrysogonus had immense political power and the accusation was successfully made due to that power. Even though Chrysogonus may not have been what Cicero said he was, but through rhetoric, Cicero successfully made him appear to be a foreign freedman who was clever enough to take advantage of the aftermath of the Civil War, and prosper. It showed what kind of a person he was and that something like murder was not beneath him. In 79 BC, Cicero left for Greece, Asia Minor and Rhodes, perhaps because of the potential wrath of Sulla. Cicero travelled to Athens, where he again met Atticus, who had become an honorary citizen of Athens and introduced Cicero to some significant Athenians. In Athens, Cicero visited the sacred sites of the philosophers, but not before he consulted different rhetoricians in order to learn a less physically exhausting style of speech. His chief instructor was the rhetorician Apollonius Molin of Rhodes. He instructed Cicero in a more expansive and less intense form of oratory that would define Cicero's individual style in years to come. Cicero's interest in philosophy figured heavily in his later career and led to him introducing Greek philosophy to Roman culture, creating a philosophical vocabulary in Latin. In 87 BC, Philo of Larissa, the head of the academy that was founded by Plato in Athens about 300 years earlier, arrived in Rome. Cicero, inspired by an extraordinary zeal for philosophy, sat enthusiastically at his feet and absorbed Plato's philosophy. He admired especially Plato's moral and political seriousness, but he also respected his breadth of imagination. Cicero nonetheless rejected Plato's theory of ideas. Cicero said of Plato's dialogues, that if Zeus were to speak, he would use their language. Public career Early political career His first office was as one of the twenty annual Calestas, a training post for serious public administration in a diversity of areas, but with a traditional emphasis on administration and rigorous accounting of public monies under the guidance of a senior magistrate or provincial commander. Cicero served as Calaster in western Sicily in 75 BC and demonstrated honesty and integrity in his dealings with the inhabitants. As a result, the grateful Sicilians asked Cicero to prosecute Gaius Vez, the governor of Sicily who had badly plundered Sicily. His prosecution of Gaius Vez was a great forensic success for Cicero. Governor Gaius Vez hired the prominent lawyer of a noble family Quintus Hortensius Hortless. After a lengthy period on Sicily collecting testimonials, evidence and persuading witnesses to come forth, 
Cicero returned to Rome and won the case in a series of dramatic court battles. His unique style of oratory set him apart from the flamboyant Hortulus. Upon the conclusion of this case, Cicero came to be considered the greatest orator in Rome. The view that Cicero may have taken the case for reasons of his own is viable. Quintus Hortensius Hortulus was, at this point, known as the best lawyer in Rome. To beat him would guarantee much success and prestige that Cicero needed to start his career. Cicero's oratorical skill is shown in his character assassination of Vares and various other persuasive techniques used towards the jury. One such example is found in the speech against Vares I, where he states with you on this bench, gentlemen, with Marcus Asilius Glabrio as your president, I do not understand what Vares can hope to achieve. Oratory was considered a great art in ancient Rome and an important tool for disseminating knowledge and promoting oneself in elections, in part because there were no regular newspapers or mass media at the time. Cicero was neither a patrician nor a plebeian noble. His rise to political office despite his relatively humble origins has traditionally been attributed to his brilliance as an orator. Cicero grew up in a time of civil unrest and war. Sulla's victory in the first of a series of civil wars led to a new constitutional framework that undermined libertas, liberty, the fundamental value of the Roman Republic. Nonetheless, Sulla's reforms strengthened the position of the equestrian class, contributing to that class's growing political power. Cicero was both an Italian ex and a novos homo, but more importantly he was a Roman constitutionalist. His social class and loyalty to the Republic ensured that he would command the support and confidence of the people as well as the Italian middle classes. The fact that the Optimates faction never truly accepted Cicero undermined his efforts to reform the Republic while preserving the Constitution. Nevertheless, he was able to successfully ascend the Roman curses honorum, holding each magistracy at or near the youngest possible age, Calaster in 75 BC, age 31. Adil in 69 BC, age 37, and Praetor in 66 BC, age 40, where he served as president of the reclamation, or extortion, court. He was then elected consul at age 43. Consul Cicero was elected consul for the year 63 BC. His co-consul for the year, Gaius Antonius Hybrida, played a minor role. During his year in office, he thwarted a conspiracy centered on assassinating him and overthrowing the Roman Republic with the help of foreign armed forces, led by Lucius Sergius Catalina. Cicero procured a senatus consultum ultimum, a declaration of martial law, and drove Catilin from the city with four vehement speeches, the Catilin orations, which to this day remain outstanding examples of his rhetorical style. The orations listed Catilin and his followers' debaucheries, and denounced Catilin's senatorial sympathizers as roguish and dissolute debtors clinging to Catilin as a final and desperate hope. Cicero demanded that Catilin and his followers leave the city. At the conclusion of his first speech, Catilin hurriedly left the Senate, which was being held in the Temple of Jupiter Stator. In his following speeches, Cicero did not directly address Catilin. He delivered the second and third orations before the people, and the last one again before the Senate. By these speeches, Cicero wanted to prepare the Senate for the worst possible case. He also delivered more evidence against Catilin. Catilin fled and left behind his followers to start the revolution from within while Catilin assaulted the city with an army of moral bankrupts and honest fanatics. Catilin had attempted to involve the Olobroges, a tribe of Transalpine Gaul, in their plot, but Cicero, working with the Gauls, was able to seize letters which incriminated the five conspirators and forced them to confess their crimes in front of the Senate. The Senate then deliberated upon the conspirators' punishment. As it was the dominant advisory body to the various legislative assemblies rather than a judicial body, there were limits to its power. However, martial law was in effect, and it was feared that simple house arrest or exile, the standard options, would not remove the threat to the state. At first Decimus Silinus spoke for the extreme penalty. Many were then swayed by Julius Caesar, who decried of the precedent it would set and argued in favor of life imprisonment in various Italian towns. K. 
Cato the Younger then rose in defense of the death penalty and all the Senate finally agreed on the matter. Cicero had the conspirators taken to the Tullianum, the notorious Roman prison, where they were strangled. Cicero himself accompanied the former consul Publius Cornelius Lentulus Shura, one of the conspirators, to the Tullianum. Cicero received the honorific Pater Petrae for his efforts to suppress the conspiracy, but lived thereafter in fear of trial or exile for having put Roman citizens to death without trial. After the conspirators were put to death, Cicero was proud of his accomplishment. Some of his political enemies argued that though the act gained Cicero popularity, he exaggerated the extent of his success. He overestimated his popularity again several years later after being exiled from Italy and then allowed back from exile. At this time, he claimed that the Republic would be restored along with him. Exile and Return In 60 BC Julius Caesar invited Cicero to be the fourth member of his existing partnership with Pompey and Marcus Licinius Crassus, an assembly that would eventually be called the First Triumvirate. Cicero refused the invitation because he suspected it would undermine the Republic. In 58 BC, Publius Clodius Pulcher, the tribune of the plebs, introduced a law, the Lex Claudii, threatening exile to anyone who executed a Roman citizen without a trial. Cicero, having executed members of the Second Catilinarian Conspiracy four years previously without formal trial, and having had a public falling out with Clodius, was clearly the intended target of the law. Cicero argued that the Senatus Consultum Ultimum indemnified him from punishment, and he attempted to gain the support of the senators and consuls, especially of Pompey. When help was not forthcoming, he went into exile. He arrived at Thessalonica, Greece, on May 23, 58 BC. Cicero's exile caused him to fall into depression. He wrote to Atticus, your pleas have prevented me from committing suicide. But what is there to live for? Don't blame me for complaining. My afflictions surpass any you ever heard of earlier. After the intervention of recently elected tribune Titus Annius Milo, the Senate voted in favor of recalling Cicero from exile. Clodius cast a single vote against the decree. Cicero returned to Italy on August 5, 57 BC, landing at Brundisium. He was greeted by a cheering crowd, and, to his delight, his beloved daughter Tullia. Cicero tried to reintegrate himself into politics, but his attack on a bill of Caesar's proved unsuccessful. The conference at Lucca in 56 BC forced Cicero to make a recantation and pledge his support to the triumvirate. With this, a coward Cicero retreated to his literary works. It is uncertain whether he had any direct involvement in politics for the following few years. He only reluctantly accepted a promagistracy in Cilicia for 51 BC, after a shortage of eligible governors was created by legislation requiring an interval of five years between a consulship or praetorship and a provincial command. He was absent from Italy as proconsul of Cilicia from May 51 to November 50 BC. Accompanied by his brother Quintus as a legate, he was mostly spared from warfare due to internal conflict among the Parthians, yet for storming a mountain fortress he acquired the title of Imperator. Julius Caesar's Civil War The struggle between Pompey and Julius Caesar grew more intense in 50 BC. Cicero chose to favor Pompey as he was in defense of the Senate and Republican tradition, but at the same time he prudently avoided openly alienating Caesar. When Caesar invaded Italy in 49 BC, Cicero fled Rome. Caesar, seeking the legitimacy and endorsement by a senior senator would provide, courted Cicero's favor, but even so Cicero slipped out of Italy and traveled to Dyrrhachium, Epidamnos, Illyria, where Pompey's staff was situated. Cicero traveled with the Pompeian forces to Pharsalus in 48 BC though he was quickly losing faith in the competence and righteousness of the Pompeian lot. Eventually, he provoked the hostility of his fellow senator Cato, who told him that he would have been of more use to the cause of the Optimates if he had stayed in Rome. After Caesar's victory at Pharsalus, Cicero returned to Rome only very cautiously. Caesar pardoned him and Cicero tried to adjust to the situation and maintain his political work hoping that Caesar might revive the Republic and its institutions. 
in a letter to Varro on c. April 20, 46 BC, Cicero outlined his strategy under Caesar's dictatorship. Cicero, however, was taken completely by surprise when the liberators assassinated Caesar on the Ides of March, 44 BC. Cicero was not included in the conspiracy, even though the conspirators were sure of his sympathy. Marcus Junius Brutus called out Cicero's name, asking him to restore the Republic when he lifted the bloodstained dagger after the assassination. A letter Cicero wrote in February 43 BC to Trebonius, one of the conspirators, began, How I could wish that you had invited me to that most glorious banquet on the Ides of March. Cicero became a popular leader during the period of instability following the assassination. He had no respect for Mark Antony, who was scheming to take revenge upon Caesar's murderers. In exchange for amnesty for the assassins, he arranged for the Senate to agree not to declare Caesar to have been a tyrant, which allowed the Caesarians to have lawful support and kept Caesar's reforms and policies intact. Opposition to Mark Antony and Death Cicero and Antony now became the two leading men in Rome, Cicero as spokesman for the Senate, Antony as consul, leader of the Caesarian faction, and unofficial executor of Caesar's public will. Relations between the two, never friendly, worsened after Cicero claimed that Antony was taking liberties in interpreting Caesar's wishes and intentions. Octavian was Caesar's adopted son and heir. After he returned to Italy, Cicero began to play him against Antony. He praised Octavian, declaring he would not make the same mistakes as his father. He attacked Antony in a series of speeches he called the Philippics, after Demosthenes's denunciations of Philip II of Macedon. At the time Cicero's popularity as a public figure was unrivaled. Cicero supported Decimus Junius Brutus Albinus as governor of Cisalpine Gaul, Gallia Cisalpina, and urged the Senate to name Antony an enemy of the state. The speech of Lucius Piso, Caesar's father-in-law, delayed proceedings against Antony. Antony was later declared an enemy of the state when he refused to lift the siege of Mutina, which was in the hands of Decimus Brutus. Cicero's plan to drive out Antony failed. Antony and Octavian reconciled and allied with Lepidus to form the Second Triumvirate after the successive battles of Forum Galorum and Mutina. The Triumvirate began prescribing their enemies and potential rivals immediately after legislating the alliance into official existence for a term of five years with Consular Imperium. Cicero and all of his contacts and supporters were numbered among the enemies of the state, and reportedly, Octavian argued for two days against Cicero being added to the list. Cicero was one of the most viciously and doggedly hunted among the prescribed. He was viewed with sympathy by a large segment of the public and many people refused to report that they had seen him. He was caught December 7, 43 BC leaving his villa in former in a little going to the seaside where he hoped to embark on a ship destined for Macedonia. When his killers, Hyrnius, a centurion, and Pope Julius, a tribune, arrived, Cicero's own slaves said they had not seen him, but he was given away by Philologus, a freed slave of his brother Quintus Cicero. Cicero's last words are said to have been, There is nothing proper about what you are doing, soldier, but do try to kill me properly. He bowed to his captors, leaning his head out of the litter in a gladiatorial gesture to ease the task. By baring his neck and throat to the soldiers, he was indicating that he wouldn't resist. According to Plutarch, Hyrnius first slew him, then cut off his head. On Antony's instructions his hands, which had penned the Philippics against Antony, were cut off as well. These were nailed along with his head on the rostra in the Forum Romanum according to the tradition of Marius and Sulla, both of whom had displayed the heads of their enemies in the Forum. Cicero was the only victim of the prescriptions to be displayed in that manner. According to Cassius Dio, in a story often mistakenly attributed to Plutarch, Antony's wife Fulvia took Cicero's head, pulled out his tongue, and jabbed it repeatedly with her hairpin in final revenge against Cicero's power of speech. Cicero's son, Marcus Tullius Cicero Minor, during his year as a consul in 30 BC, avenged his father's death, to a certain extent, when he announced to the Senate Mark Antony's naval defeat at Actium in 31 BC by Octavian and his capable commander-in-chief, Agrippa. 
Octavian, or Augustus, as he was later called, is reported to have praised Cicero as a patriot and a scholar of meaning in later times, within the circle of his family. However, it was the acquiescence of Augustus that had allowed Cicero to be killed, as Cicero was prescribed by the new triumvirate. However, his career as a statesman was marked by inconsistencies and a tendency to shift his position in response to changes in the political climate. His indecision may be attributed to his sensitive and impressionable personality. He was prone to overreaction in the face of political and private change. With that he had been able to endure prosperity with greater self-control, and adversity with more fortitude. Wrote C. Asinius Pollio, a contemporary Roman statesman and historian. Family Cicero married Terentia probably at the age of 27, in 79 BC. According to the upper-class laws of the day it was a marriage of convenience, but endured harmoniously for some thirty years. Terentia's family was wealthy, probably the plebeian noble house of Terenti by Rome's, thus meeting the needs of Cicero's political ambitions in both economic and social terms. She had a half-sister, or perhaps first cousin, named Fabia, who as a child had become a Vestal Virgin, a very great honor. Terentia was a strong-willed woman and, citing Plutarch, she took more interest in her husband's political career than she allowed him to take in household affairs. In the 50s BC, Cicero's letters to Terentia became shorter and colder. He complained to his friends that Terentia had betrayed him but did not specify in which sense. Perhaps the marriage simply could not outlast the strain of the political upheaval in Rome, Cicero's involvement in it, and various other disputes between the two. The divorce appears to have taken place in 51 BC or shortly before. In 46 or 45 BC, Cicero married a young girl, Pablilia, who had been his ward. It is thought that Cicero needed her money, particularly after having to repay the dowry of Terentia, who came from a wealthy family. This marriage did not last long. Although his marriage to Terentia was one of convenience, it is commonly known that Cicero held great love for his daughter Tullia. When she suddenly became ill in February 45 BC and died after having seemingly recovered from giving birth to a son in January, Cicero was stunned. I have lost the one thing that bound me to life he wrote to Atticus. Atticus told him to come for a visit during the first weeks of his bereavement, so that he could comfort him when his pain was at its greatest. In Atticus's large library, Cicero read everything that the Greek philosophers had written about overcoming grief, but my sorrow defeats all consolation. Caesar and Brutus as well as Servius Sulpicius Rufus sent him letters of condolence. Cicero hoped that his son Marcus would become a philosopher like him, but Marcus himself wished for a military career. He joined the army of Pompey in 49 BC and after Pompey's defeat at Pharsalus 48 BC, he was pardoned by Caesar. Cicero sent him to Athens to study as a disciple of the peripatetic philosopher Critopos in 48 BC, but he used this absence from his father's vigilant eye to eat, drink and be merry. After Cicero's murder he joined the army of the liberators but was later pardoned by Augustus. Augustus bad conscience for not having objected to Cicero's being put on the prescription list during the Second Triumvirate led him to aid considerably Marcus Minor's career. He became an augur, and was nominated consul in 30 BC together with Augustus. As such, he was responsible for revoking the honors of Mark Antony, who was responsible for the prescription, and could in this way take revenge. Later he was appointed proconsul of Syria and the province of Asia. Legacy Cicero has been traditionally considered the master of Latin prose, with Quintilian declaring Cicero was not the name of a man, but of eloquence itself. He is credited with transforming Latin from a modest utilitarian language into a versatile literary medium capable of expressing abstract and complicated thoughts with clarity. Julius Caesar praised Cicero's achievement by saying it is more important to have greatly extended the frontiers of the Roman spirit, and genium, than the frontiers of the Roman Empire according to John William McHale, Cicero's unique and imperishable glory is that he created the language of the civilized world, and used that language to create a style which 19 centuries have not replaced, and in some respects have hardly altered. 
Cicero was also an energetic writer with an interest in a wide variety of subjects in keeping with the Hellenistic philosophical and rhetorical traditions in which he was trained. The quality and ready accessibility of Ciceronian texts favored very wide distribution and inclusion in teaching curricula as suggested by an amusing graffito at Pompeii admonishing you will like Cicero, or you will be whipped Cicero was greatly admired by influential Latin church fathers such as Augustine of Hippo, who credited Cicero's lost Hortensius for his eventual conversion to Christianity and St. Jerome, who had a feverish vision in which he was accused of being follower of Cicero and not of Christ before the judgment seat. This influence further increased after the Dark Ages in Europe, from which more of his writings survived than any other Latin author. Medieval philosophers were influenced by Cicero's writings on natural law and innate rights. Petrarch's rediscovery of Cicero's letters provided impetus for searches for ancient Greek and Latin writings scattered throughout European monasteries, and the subsequent rediscovery of classical antiquity led to the Renaissance. Subsequently, Cicero came to be regarded synonymous with classical Latin to such an extent that humanist scholars began to assert that no Latin word or phrase was to be used unless it could be found in Cicero's works, a stance criticized by Erasmus. His voluminous correspondence, much of it addressed to his friend Atticus, has been especially influential, introducing the art of refined letter writing to European culture. Cornelius Nepos, the first century BC biographer of Atticus, remarked that Cicero's letters contained such a wealth of detail concerning the inclinations of leading men, the faults of the generals, and the revolutions in the government that their reader had little need for a history of the period. Among Cicero's admirers were Desiderius Erasmus, Martin Luther, and John Locke. Following the invention of the printing press, De Officius was the second book to be printed, second only to the Gutenberg Bible. Scholars note Cicero's influence on the rebirth of religious toleration in the 17th century. While Cicero the humanist deeply influenced the culture of the Renaissance, Cicero the Republican inspired the founding fathers of the United States and the revolutionaries of the French Revolution. John Adams said of him as all the ages of the world have not produced a greater statesman and philosopher united than Cicero, his authority should have great weight. Jefferson names Cicero as one of a handful of major figures who contributed to a tradition of public right that informed his draft to the Declaration of Independence and shaped American understandings of the common sense basis for the right of revolution. Camille Desmoulins said of the French Republicans in 1789 that they were mostly young people who, nourished by the reading of Cicero at school, had become passionate enthusiasts for liberty. Jim Powell starts his book on the history of liberty with the sentence, Marcus Tullius Cicero expressed principles that became the bedrock of liberty in the modern world. Legitimate government protects liberty and justice according to natural law. Marianne Rothbard praised Cicero as the great transmitter of Stoic ideas from Greece to Rome. Stoic natural law doctrines helped shape the great structures of Roman law which became pervasive in Western civilization. Government's purpose was the protection of private property. Likewise, no other antique personality has inspired as much venomous dislike as Cicero especially in more modern times. His commitment to the values of the Republic accommodated a hatred of the poor and persistent opposition to the advocates and mechanisms of popular representation. Friedrich Engels referred to him as the most contemptible scoundrel in history for upholding Republican democracy while at the same time denouncing land and class reforms. Cicero has faced criticism for exaggerating the democratic qualities of Republican Rome, and for defending the Roman oligarchy against the popular reforms of Caesar. Michael Parenti admits Cicero's abilities as an orator, but finds him a vain, pompous and hypocritical personality who, when it suited him, could show public support for popular causes that he privately despised. Parenti presents Cicero's prosecution of the Catilian conspiracy as legally flawed at least, and possibly unlawful. Cicero also had an influence on modern astronomy. Nicolaus Copernicus, searching for ancient views on Earth motion, said that he first found in Cicero that Heister supposed the Earth to move. Works Cicero was declared a righteous pagan by the early Catholic Church, and therefore many of his works were deemed worthy of preservation. Subsequent Roman writers quoted liberally from his works De Republica, 
on the Republic, and De Legibus, on the Laws, and much of his work has been recreated from these surviving fragments. Cicero also articulated an early, abstract conceptualization of rights, based on ancient law and custom. Of Cicero's books, six on rhetoric have survived, as well as parts of eight on philosophy. Of his speeches, 88 were recorded, but only 58 survive. 81 BC, pro Quinctio, in defense of Quinctius, 80 BC, pro Rosio Amarino, in defense of Sextus Rossius of Amria, 70 BC, in Vera Mai, 2 1 5, against Gaius Vers, or the Verinorations, 69 BC, pro Fontuo, in defense of Fontus, 69 BC, pro Cassina, in defense of Cassina, 66 BC, pro Clancio, in defense of Arles Clancius, 66 BC, de Imperio ne Pompeo de Liege Manilia, on the command of Naeus Pompey, in support of Pompey's appointment to command the Roman forces against Mithridates v. 63 BC, de Liege Agraria contra Rulum I III, on the agrarian law proposed by Rulus, 63 BC, in Catilinum I IV. Catilin orations or against Catilin, archived March 2, 2005 at the Wayback Machine, 63 BC, pro Rabirio Perdalianus Rio, in defense of Gaius Rabirius, in the court for treason, 62 BC, pro Sulla, in defense of Faustus Sulla, 62 BC, pro Archia Peter, in defense of Aulus Licinius Archius the poet, 59 BC, pro Flacco, in defense of Flaccus, 57 BC, Post reditum in C. Natu, speech to the Senate after his return, 57 BC, post reditum at Quirits, speech to the people after his return, 57 BC, de domo sue, on his house, 57 BC, de haruspicum responses, on the response of the haruspices, 56 BC, pro cestio, in defense of Cestius, 56 BC, in Vatinium, cross examination of Vatinius. 56 BC, pro Celio, in defense of Marcus Celius Rufus, English translation, 56 BC, to Provincius Consul Rubus, on the consular provinces, 56 BC, pro Bulbo, in defense of Cornelius Balbus, 55 BC, in Picenum, against Piso, 54 BC, pro Rabirio Postumo, in defense of Rabirius Postumus, 52 BC, pro Malone, in defense of Titus Annius Milo, 46 BC, pro Marcello, in support of the recall of Marcellus, 46 BC, pro Ligario, in defense of Quintus Ligarius, 45 BC, pro Diotaro, in defense of King Diotarus, 44 43 BC, Philippici, the 14 Philippics, Philippical I 14, against Mark Antony, 55 BC, the orator ad Quintum Fratrum Libritus, on the orator, three books for his brother Quintus, 51 BC, De Republica, on the Republic, BC, De Legibus, on the laws, 46 BC, Brutus, Brutus, 46 BC, Orator, Orator, 45 BC, Academica, on academic skepticism, 45 BC, De Finibus Benorum A Malorum, on the Ends of Good and Bad Things, a book on ethics. Title also translated as On Moral Ends. 45 BC, Tusculani Disputations, Tusculan Disputations, Five Books on Death, Pain, Depression and Related Passions, and Happiness as a State of Mind. 45 BC, Hortensius, An Exhortation to Philosophy, Now Lost. 45 BC, Consolatio to soothe his grief after the death of Tullia in February of the same year. Also lost, 45 BC, De Natura Diorum, on the nature of the gods, 44 BC, De Divination, on divination, 44 BC, De Fato, on fate, 44 BCE, De Amicitia, on friendship, 44 BC, Cato made a senecute, Cato the Elder on old age, 44 BC, Laelius de Amicitia, Laelius on friendship, 44 BC, De Gloria, on glory, now lost, 44 BC, De Officius, on duties. More than 900 letters by Cicero to others have survived, and over 100 letters from others to him. 
68-43 BC, Epistuli Atticum, Letters to Atticus, 59-54 BC, Epistuli Ad Quintum Fratrum, Letters to his brother Quintus, 43 BC, Epistuli Ad Brutum, Letters to Brutus, 62-43 BC, Epistuli Ad Familias, Letters to his friends. Notable fictional portrayals Ben Johnson dramatized the conspiracy of Catillon in his play Catillon His Conspiracy, featuring Cicero as a character. Cicero also appears as a minor character in William Shakespeare's play Julius Caesar. Cicero was portrayed on the motion picture screen by British actor Alan Napier in the 1953 film Julius Caesar, based on Shakespeare's play. He has also been played by such noted actors as Michael Hordron, in Cleopatra, and Andre Morel, in the 1970 Julius Caesar. Most recently, Cicero was portrayed by David Bammer in the HBO series Rome, 2005-2007, and appeared in both seasons. In her series of historical novels Masters of Rome Colleen McCulloch presents an unflattering depiction of Cicero's career showing him struggling with an inferiority complex and vanity, morally flexible and fatally indiscreet, while his rival Julius Caesar is shown in a more approving light. Cicero is portrayed as a hero in the novel A Pillar of Iron by Taylor Caldwell, 1965. Robert Harris novels Imperium and Lustrum, Conspirata in the U.S. are the first two parts of a planned trilogy of novels based upon the life of Cicero. In these novels Cicero's character is depicted in a more balanced way than in those of McCulloch, with his positive traits equaling or outweighing his weaknesses, while conversely Caesar is depicted as more sinister than in McCulloch. Cicero is a major recurring character in the Roma Sub Rosa series of mystery novels by Stephen Saylor. He also appears several times as a peripheral character in John Maddox Roberts's SPQR series. Roberts's protagonist, Decius Metellus, admires Cicero for his erudition, but is disappointed by his lack of real opposition to Caesar, as well as puzzled by his relentless fawning on the Optimates, who secretly despise Cicero as a parvenu.